One of the many connections between the composers Schubert and Bruckner is the fact that they both studied counterpoint with the person I consider the worst composer who ever lived. Simon Zechter was the go-to person when you wanted to study counterpoint in Vienna in the 19th century. And Schubert, in 1828, shortly before he died, went to Zechter and had one lesson. 27 years later, Bruckner, at the age of 31, went to Zechter and spent six years studying his method and eventually getting it so well ingrained in him that when Zechter died, he succeeded him as professor of counterpoint at the Vienna Conservatory. So they both had this connection with this man, and yet, if you look at his music, which I did in considerable detail, you are confronted with music of unbelievable rigidity and dullness. And yet, he knew so much. This was a person who simultaneously could take a composer like Schubert and correct his counterpoint, and yet himself wrote music that is astonishingly dull. But the question is, what makes it so special bad? And what makes Zechter's music so special bad is the fact that he was exceedingly brilliantly talented. If you take any one bar of his music, it's exquisite. The voice leading is perfect. The counterpoint is perfect. Everything about it is absolutely beautiful. And yet, as a totality, it falls apart. And why is that? That is because music is more than the individual mo moments. It's also motion. It's where it goes. It's how it develops. And this is the way in which a composer like Schubert or a composer like Bruckner were so much better than a composer like Zechter. Both Schubert and Bruckner said they benefited greatly by working with Zechter. Schubert only had one lesson, but he said that he, at the end of that lesson, he knew how to write invertible counterpoint, which is what he went to him for in the first place. In Bruckner's case, the six years that he spent with Zechter gave him the foundation for the contrapuntal writing that was in, so inspired in some of his symphonies, in particular in the Fifth Symphony. But if you take a look at it, there was a limitation to it. The limitation was that after those six years, he still had to go and study another two years with the pedagogue Otto Kitzler, and it was in his two years with Kitzler that he developed the compositional skill by writing a bunch of small pieces that eventually led to the F minor symphony that we're going to hear. The F minor symphony was kind of his graduation exercise with Kitzler, but it is on its own an inspired piece of music, and I'm very interested in having you all hear it at our concert. This was the fugue in C minor that he wrote. By the way, he was the most prolific composer in history. He wrote over 5,000 fugues. He used to try to write one every day. The fugue in C minor that he wrote in memory of Franz Schubert, based upon the, uh, the notes that can be corresponding to the letters of his name. So he begins with an E flat, the tune, which is the letter S in German notation, goes to a C, and then H, which is a B natural in uh, German notation, then a B, which is B flat in German notation, and then an E natural. So you have this exceedingly pregnant and very, very, there's potential, enormous potential for motion in this. And then he continues. tune. It's got all sorts of things in it. Now, what does he do with it? Well, nothing. He does a standard fugal exposition, four voices, and then it just kind of falls apart. Now, this is an interesting case. I have played about a dozen or so of Zechter's fugues. Uh, that's all I could take. And this is by far the best. There was deep feeling behind it. He was very moved by Schubert's death. And he, at the top of it, he says, in memory of he who died too young. And it's got all of this feeling in it. 
and yet it still is completely confined by his own rigidities. Now, I'm going to try to play this in a way which undermines my thesis. The music has literally nothing in it except the notes. There's no dynamics, there's no articulations, nothing. I'm going to create all of that. The only thing there are are two tempo indications, Molto Adagio and Andante. Molto Adagio for the introduction, Andante for the fugue, and Molto Adagio at the end. Now, I want you to listen to this. I'm going to add all this expression. I'm going to try to make it very, very good. Maybe you will disagree with me, but maybe you'll also hear what I'm talking about. 